Good morning. Welcome to worship on this day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we are gathering here this morning in the home of our Heavenly Father, we know whenever we are in our parents' house, we are home. So whether this is the first time you've ever been with us or if you've been gathering with us for years, welcome home, everyone. Uh, I know we do have quite a few guests out here today. We are blessed to have our Sunday school students. We'll be providing special music for us later on in the service, and we are very, very excited about that. With all of that out of the way, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and get up. Get up. I can't talk today. It's going to be one of those days. Get up out of your seats, everybody. We're going to join in our first hour. <laughs> for worship on this day, we know that there are those things in our lives that stand the way of our relationship with our Maker. And so now I invite you into a time of mutual confession as we join together in the brief order found on page 56 in our hymnals. We gather together today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all <laughs> desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment now for personal reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have not undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us join in reading responsibly from Psalm 32 as printed in your bulletin. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they whose While I hold my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand is heavy upon me, and I don't want you to strike up as you believe the Son. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like a horse for evil, which have no understanding. You must be very prepared and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked. But mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. We be glad your righteousness and the grace of the Lord. Shout for joy and all who are true of heart. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward, and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, you clothe us with garments of your grace, and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Our second reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one with a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made, this, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here is the readings. I now invite Sunday school children to come forward. <laughs>
up? No. I know there's two more of you out there. That was really great, guys. I really like that song. What was it about? Yeah. Uh, that Jesus is always going to be there for you. Yeah, Jesus is always here for you. And, and what were you guys saying? Yeah, come on. Come on. Like when you slap your hand together, what were you saying? Yeah. He's a rock. He's a rock. So, do you guys, do any of you, like at your house, out in the yard, maybe have like a really humongous big rock that just sits there? No? no. no? You do? Okay. Have you? Good. I'm glad at least one of you do. Have you ever seen that, like when you're out walking or maybe you're on a drive and you go, you go by a house and they've got this humongous big rock that's just sitting out there in their yard? You've never seen that? Yeah. Yeah? You have? Well, okay. Well, a few of you have. So, do me a favor. When you're all going home today, look and see if you can see any great big enormous rocks that are sitting in people's yards. Now, for those of you who have seen that, or maybe you have one in your yard, can you move that thing? No. Have you, have you ever tried? Like, gone up like, I'm going to move this rock, I don't want to hear anymore. No? What do you think would happen if you tried? Like, if you were just going to pick it up and carry it away, you think you could? No. You could? How come? Because it's too heavy. Because it's too big, it's too heavy. Yes, it's solid, right? And it's always going to be there. It just won't, I mean, you would have to have like humongous, enormous, great big cranes to try and move it because they're so heavy, right? Yeah. And so I was thinking about that idea while you guys were singing your song about how God is a rock for us. Because those rocks, they're always going to be there, right? They don't go anywhere. And they're solid. And we can depend on them to always be there. And the promises that God makes to each one of us are the same way. And that's, I think, what your guys' song was about. That's why I really liked it. I liked it a lot because God promises to always love us and to, that God promises to take joy in us all the time. And just like those great big humongous rocks that are unmovable, they just stay there forever, God's love is always there for us too. And that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, okay, let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your promises to each one of us and that they are everlasting like those rocks in the song. We ask that you would help us to always remember that and hold on to your promises. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up, everybody. gospel is actually fairly lengthy, so I'm going to invite you to just remain seated. Otherwise, you know, like they always say in weddings, don't lock your knees, you might pass out and fall over. I don't want that to happen to anybody. So just go ahead and stay seated. Our gospel lesson for today, the fourth Sunday of Lent, comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and 11 through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. 
For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you. And I have never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours, but we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. People of God, may the grace and peace of our triune God be yours today and forever. Amen. As we are reaching the end of March, we're moving into April, we're reaching a season that is very important in the life of some of our young people, specifically our high school upperclassmen. And that is prom season. Prom. Prom is wonderful. And yet it's really, really fancy. And because of that, everyone's thinking about what are they going to wear? Fancy dresses, fancy hairdos, super spiffy tuxes. For those of you who don't know, my son is a senior this year, and so he's thinking about tuxes. This past week, he went off to the store to get his tux rented, and that night at the supper table, we were talking about it and all the different options. So many options. One of the options that he was talking about was the shirt. What kind of shirt will he wear? Will he wear some off, off the, uh, what am I trying to say? Some really, really strange, weird color? Will he go all traditional and wear just the typical white shirt? And then he says, or I could choose an all black shirt and I would look like John Wick. I hear a few of you laughing, but I also hear some of you not laughing. The second he said John Wick, my wife, who's not a movie buff, went, who? And this prompted a discussion talking about John Wick. Now, if you don't know John Wick, he's a character, currently a trilogy of movies, although there's talk of more of them coming down the pipe. And he's an interesting story, interesting premise behind, especially the first movie. Now, he's played by Keanu Reeves, and the whole premise for the first movie is that he is a retired former assassin for the Russian Mafia. You can't make this stuff up. Actually, you can't, it's a big movie, but. The first movie, throughout the course of the entire plot, he is seeking revenge on a particular individual. And, full disclosure, it's kind of a bloody movie, there's a lot of killing in it, which probably is not the best thing, but hey, I'm, I like movies, so yes, I've seen it. And the whole time, he's seeking revenge on this one individual who stole his car and killed his dog. That's the premise of the entire movie. And as the movie goes on, and person after person after person meets their maker, if you're anything like me, you kind of cheer just a little bit. And especially when he gets to that last guy, spoilers, he does get to the last guy. And you think, he got what he deserved. And maybe you even cheer just a little bit. Dead silence. Yes, I cheered. I did. I did. I'll admit that. <laughs> Now, I thought about that. Perhaps you're wondering, why are you sharing this, Pastor? That's a little bit weird. Isn't it true, when we're honest with ourselves, that we probably all have that tendency just a little bit? To think along the lines of, they got what they deserved. That's probably okay. We can justify it. I think it's human nature. It's not something any of us are probably proud of, but it's human nature. I got to thinking about how we can look in our own history the history of the church, and we can see the same sort of thing. Here in the Lutheran church, if I say the name Diedrich Bonhoeffer, how many of you know who I'm talking about? Okay, I'm seeing some hands. We don't have to look very far back in our history. Bonhoeffer was a young Lutheran pastor in World War II in Germany. 
when Bonhoeffer was arrested and eventually executed because he was playing part in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. When we think about Hitler, we probably think, well, is that so bad? Because he committed atrocities. He would have deserved it. When I think about current events, I have to admit to you, I've had the same thought because of some things that are going on on the other side of the world right now. We have an individual leading an enormous army that's invaded another country who has threatened world repercussions if he doesn't get his way. And yes, the thought has gone through my head, would this world be safer if he's not in it? This is all kind of dark, and I will admit that. But I think this idea of the way that we pass judgment on other people is what's lying underneath that parable that Jesus tells today. And that's why I've shared this. Jesus takes criticism because of some of the people that he associates with. He is criticized by the religious elite because he eats with sinners. He spends time with sinners, with people that they have deemed to be unacceptable, that they have deemed to be unworthy of inclusion. And they criticize Jesus for it. And Jesus begins to tell parables. He tells stories. And he actually tells three of them. Two of them are very, very short, but they all go in line along with the story of the prodigal son that we've heard. The first one tells a story about a shepherd who's got a hundred sheep, and one of them gets lost. And so the shepherd leaves the 99, and he goes and he searches high and low everywhere until he finds that lost sheep, and he picks it up, and he brings it home, and he calls his neighbors together, and he says, we must celebrate that which was lost as been. From there, he tells another parable, another short story of a woman who's got 10 coins, and she loses one of them. And so she lights a lamp, and she searches everywhere in her house, high and low. She's moving the furniture until finally she finds that lost coin. And she likewise calls her neighbors together and says, we must celebrate that which was lost has been found. And then he goes into this story that we have shared today about a father with two sons. A story that we commonly call the prodigal son. Now, there's a lot going on in this story. This younger son, who seems to be a little bit of a flighty jerk, he comes up to his dad and he essentially says, you're dead to me, give me my inheritance. And he takes his newfound wealth and he goes off into a distant country where we hear, he's, we hear he squanders his money. And once his money's all gone, there's a famine, and now he's in need. And he needs to do something in order to try and earn a living for himself. So he gets hired to go out and feed the pigs. In Jewish culture, he would never willingly associate with or be around pigs. They're unclean animals. This is how low he has sank. And he's hungry. And he's, he wishes he could even eat what the pigs are eating, but he's got nothing. And in this, when he hits rock bottom... He realizes, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? I have done a horrible thing. I've sinned against my father. I'm not worthy of being called his son, but I'm going to go. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to see if my dad will hire me so at least I can have some food. So he goes home. And as he's on his way, then we hear about dad. And while dad wasn't actively searching for his lost son, like in those other two parables, he's watching for him. And we hear he spots his son, and the second he spots him, he, he, all the corn's out the window, he pulls up his robe, he runs to his son, he embraces him, he says, put the robe on him, put a ring on his finger, let's have a party, we must celebrate. That which was lost has been found. And that's exactly what they do. They kill the calf, they start the party, sounds like there's a DJ playing with some really great beats because it's really loud. And then we got Big Brother. Big Brother's coming in from the field, and he hears the DJ playing, and he says, what is going on? And the servant says, your brother's back, and your father is celebrating. Come into the celebration, and Big Brother gets really ticked off. Refuses to go in. 
And so once more, Dad goes looking for the one who's missing. He goes looking for Big Brother. And Big Brother gives him the riot act. For years, I have done what I was supposed to. I've followed all the rules. I've done everything perfect that's been expected of me. And you've never thrown me a party. What gives, Dad? And Dad says, your brother was gone. He was dead. And now he's alive again. He's lost. And now he's found. We must celebrate. That's where the story ends. It ends kind of abruptly. And we don't know whatever happens with Big Brother. And maybe, just maybe, the scripture is intentional that we don't know what happens with Big Brother, that we don't have a resolution here. But when we look at his words, when we look at his demeanor, when we look at what he gets all up in arms about, it seems that he is passing judgment on little brother. He's deeming him to be unworthy because of his actions, because of what he has done. He's not worth it. He would deserve it if you cast him out, Dad. He doesn't deserve to be part of the family. He doesn't deserve to be reinstated. He doesn't. How often do we do that? How often do we fall in that same trap, whether we need to or not? We're all guilty of it, every single one of us. Sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but we all pass judgment on the ones that we think aren't good enough, the ones that we think aren't worthy, whether it's a group of people or whether it's individuals, we're all guilty of it. So it would seem that every single one of us is the big brother. While also, at times, being the younger brother, in need of mercy, in need of acceptance. And we throw ourselves at the feet of the one who can offer it to us. I wish I could say that the church is immune to this problem, but we're not. We are not. And something happened this past week that caught my attention, and I think it's a pretty good example of this. A place that's pretty dear to me, Luther Seminary, it's where I did my seminary education. It's up in St. Paul. News broke this week that the leadership of the seminary has denied going through a process that's called reconciling in Christ. It's called RIC, and I'll explain to you what RIC is. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. RIC is a process that a religious organization can go through, whether it's a congregation or in this case a seminary, in which they affirm, they accept, and they include LGBTQ individuals. And of all the, the ELCA seminaries, and there's seven or eight of them, Luther is the only one that does not hold that distinction. It's the only one. Now, they denied going through the process in a statement that says, we include everybody. But in their refusal to go through the process, they are excluding people. They are making people feel less than. They are saying, you are not worthy of this. Now, folks, here's the deal. I know we all fall on a very wide margin, or a very wide scale on that question. And I'm not going to tell you how to think. I'm not going to tell you how you need to understand that. That's not my job. But this is an example of the church saying, you don't get it. You don't deserve it. You're not worthy of it. And there's only one person that gets to make that call, and that person is dad. We don't belong in that judgment seat, even though we tend to think we do. Dad says we must celebrate. That which is lost has been found. That which is dead is now alive. And we as a community must celebrate that. I think we need to hold on to that. And I think we need to wrestle with that. With whatever group it is in the back of our heads that we think, no, I don't think they get it. Because that's God's place to call. I'm going to close with another story. Some of you have probably heard me say this before, but I think it's true. When I think about heaven, and when I think about the day when 
God's promises for me are fulfilled and I enter into heaven, I'm going to look around and there's going to be somebody there and I'm going to be like, huh, they let you in? And they're going to look right back at me and they're going to say the same darn thing. You got it. Jesus drew all people to himself on the cross. We read that in the scriptures. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And last time I checked, all people includes everybody. Whether we get it or not, whether we like it or not, the celebration is not complete until the whole family's there. So let's hold on to that as we wrestle with difficult things in this world that we're all a part of. Amen. service now continues as we offer it back to God that which he's first given us with our offerings. to share while we are collecting our offering reminder of our ongoing Wednesday evening activities for Lent. Uh, next couple of Wednesdays still going on. We have dinners beginning at 6 and a short worship service uh, up here at 7 o'clock. You're certainly invited to participate in that if you feel so wet. Uh, this Thursday evening for our 5th grade families we'll be having our Holy Communion class or Communion Education that's going to begin at 7 o'clock. 
We're looking forward to spending that time with our fifth graders. We will celebrate with the fifth graders the evening of Monday, Thursday, uh, which is April 14th. We will have a communion service that evening, which will be a celebration for them. Anyone is invited to be a part of that service, to be here and, uh, and join in that time together, but that will be our celebration for our fifth graders. Also, as we move towards Holy Week, Good Friday, which is the next day, April 15th, also tax day, don't forget that. Uh, we will be having worship that evening as well, which will be a combination of some traditional liturgy, uh, some of our traditional liturgy, along with our service of Tenebrae that oftentimes happens on Good Friday. So that will be happening that evening. Then, Easter Sunday on the 17th, we will have our sunrise service, which will be led by our confirmation <laughs> students. Now, folks, I've been working with the confirmation students um, for planning that service. We might be in for some treats uh, with what they're talking about. There's Brace yourselves. There is talk, though I'm trying to dissuade them, of chicken sacrifice. Yeah, you like seriously. It's it's probably not going to happen if, if they don't raise enough offering. They want to kill a chicken. I don't know why, but they do. There's also talk of a rap battle for uh, the brief order of confession and forgiveness, which, if we could pull that off, would be amazing. But. That's still in process, so just note that that is going on. Then also that day, we'll have regular worship at 10.15 as well. Um, seniors uh, that are graduating, reminder scholarship applications are due into the church office by this Friday, by April 1st, uh, so that is coming right up. And also, for anyone who doesn't have lunch plans today, remember that Dollars for Scholars meal is happening down at Umba Hall. In fact, I think it's already started. It uh, goes till about 1 o'clock, so if, uh, that is a good way to uh, help out and support within our community. The uh, last thing I want to announce today is two weeks from today, on April 10th, we will be having a brief congregational meeting after worship. Um, actually, at the end of service, uh, Joyce Tark is going to pop up here and give you a little bit more information about that. Uh, but just know that that is coming up and we will continue announcing that as we move forward. Uh, I'm going to invite you to rise now as we join together in the prayers of the church. Lord in heaven, on this day which you have made, we gather our hearts and our minds together, connected by the Holy Spirit as a community of faith. We thank you for the opportunity to gather the strength that we find in one another, the joy of celebration as the body of Christ. Continue to connect us with all of the body of Christ around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, help us to see our blind spots and to recognize the ways that we pass judgment on others. Forgive us when we do this. Help us to have eyes to see one another as you see each one of us. We ask for the strength to live our lives in celebration of the work that Christ has accomplished and to live our lives in a way that they are a testament to your work in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Blessed Spirit of God, we pray for all those in need of your healing touch on this day. We ask that you would be present with any who are suffering, whether it is physical or spiritual or emotional. We pray for those who are battling illnesses or who are waiting for medical procedures, as well as those who are recovering from them. We pray for any whose mental well-being is a struggle, that they would find the peace that they need. We pray for any who are mourning the loss of loved ones on this day, that they would find comfort. We remember especially today Janet, Galen, Nancy, Maisie, Jan Aaron's friend Kathy, the Lee family, and any others that we hold in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of all people, we continue to pray for peace in the Ukraine. We ask that this conflict would come to an end, that peace would be found, and that the invaders would withdraw. We pray especially for those who are innocent and have been caught in the crossfire, as well as the countless people who have been displaced by this ongoing conflict. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, we pray for all people who serve in positions of leadership and authority at every level. We thank you for those who have the gifts and the willingness to serve, and we pray that you would give them wisdom and mindfulness of those that are affected by the decisions which they make. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. God of the world, we thank you for the continued signs of spring which are around us and serve as a reminder of the ways that you are always working to bring new life into this world. Continue to watch over those who are in places still experiencing harsh weather. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Finally, Lord, we pray for those who do not know you. May the gospel of Christ continue to move throughout the world and touch the hearts of all people, so that one day all may come to faith. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, come on thee thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as if we forgive those who trespass against us. I'm actually going to invite you to go ahead and be seated. Joyce, if you want to come on up here, she's going to share just a little bit of information with us. Well, I want to thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes of your time to pass on some information from the church council. Our president, Tracy Shreves, is on vacation, so I will be giving a short uh, presentation this morning. I'm going to be using my notes, and some. I'm gonna read some information to you because I don't wanna forget anything. I wanna make sure I cover all the points. Oh, I have such a loud voice. I don't think I even need this. Oh, you need Okay, can you hear me in the back? Yes, unfortunately they can all, even outside the wall, they can hear me. Okay, I want to start with a little bit of a timeline. In May of 2021, the endowment committee indicated there were funds available to remodel the Parsonage kitchen and two bathrooms. Pastor and the endowment committee worked together to obtain bids for the project. There were two initial bids from two separate contractors, one of the two, Remodeling Dreams of Council Bluffs, provided a more detailed bid with a thorough breakdown of costs by room. So in June of 2021, at the council meeting, Pastor presented the two bids to the council. The council voted to send the remodel bids to the endowment committee for their review and approval. In July of 2021, the bids were with the endowment committee. In August of 2021, the remodeling project was tabled and the two bids were still valid. In August of 2020, or in the remain, for the remainder of 2021, the project was just tabled. So February, fast forward February 2022, the remodeling project has been revisited. Remodeling Dreams sent an updated bid with their costs for um, labor and materials and as you might guess, the project has increased a little bit. Um, the standing bid for the total project comes in at $75,000. At the March council meeting, 2022, the council approved the project moving forward with designated funds from the endowment committee. The funding was requested and approved by the endowment committee following conversations and a special vote with that committee. That brings us up to date on why we're calling for a congregational meeting and a vote. Our constitution and the endowment bylaws indicate that the council and the endowment committee may take this action and we can move forward. However, both groups feel that transparency and the support of the congregation is needed for this large scale project. Things that will be included in the project, complete remodel and update of the kitchen, complete remodel and update of two bathrooms, one full, one half on the main floor, update of flooring on the main floor, and update of trim and doors, interior doors throughout the house. So I wanna thank you again for your time. The council wanted to make sure that the congregation had accurate information. And we want to thank you for your support as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, again, a reminder that meeting will be in two weeks on the 10th of April, right after worship. So if you are a voting member that day, we'll invite you to stick around. Hopefully we can move that, through that process rather quickly. I'll invite the congregation to rise now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.